Hello everyone, my name is Nicole Fegan, and if you haven't picked up on this yet, uh, I really love books. Back when I was making videos from like, what was that, 2012 to 2017, I made a few videos just like about my favorite books, just like talking about 10 of them. And I wanted to make one of those like an updated version of that, um, but wanted to do something a little bit different with it. I read a lot of the same types of books because I've mostly figured out the genres that I like. I read a lot of classics, um, I read a lot of classics. <laughs> A lot of classics, a lot of poetry, um, not a lot of like genre fiction, if you will. So both to challenge myself and also like be able to provide recommendations to people who do like sci-fi or fantasy or horror, uh, these are my 10 favorite books by genre. In this video, I will be going over my favorite classic, my favorite play, favorite poetry book, nonfiction book, young adult book, contemporary, fantasy, historical, horror, and sci-fi. So if you're specifically interested in one of those genres, I will leave timestamps in the description below so you can can go to wherever in this video you are most curious about. So to start, the genre I have read the most of uh, is classics. Like, of my top five favorite books of all time, I think most of them could probably be considered classics. And my favorite classic of all time is also my favorite book of all time, and that is The Waves by Virginia Woolf. This is a book that follows the lives of six central characters from childhood to death. Um, and it is told in this unconventional narration of, like, internalized soliloquies, um, that each character kind of like takes up a page or a few pages and it goes back and forth between them um, in this like poeticized, beautiful, gorgeous prose. The book is split up into sections kind of like by era of their lives um, and it's split up by these descriptions of waves crashing on a shore. Midway through the book one of their other friends um, dies, this is not a spoiler, this is like right on the back of the book, and you see them process their lives and process this grief as they just go through life. There is no other piece of art I've consumed that quite gets how I feel about life like this one. Um, it is so centered on like the beauty and just like the pure experience of life. I first discovered this book um, when the summer before my freshman year of college I looked up most poetic books and this came up as a recommendation in like a Goodreads list and it really is true. Every single line feels so richly constructed, like there's not a word out of place in this thing. And I think each character kind of has like a central value, um, and what I find so beautiful about this book is A, how like effectively Wolf is able to communicate um, the, these characters' feelings about these central values, and also the fact that you have this friend group that comes together in pairs and in moments and in glances and in scenes that just like, despite them all being so different, uh, there is this like central love. My favorite scenes in this book, there are a couple times where like they meet up after years or decades um, and they have like these dinner, not dinner parties, but they just have these dinners and seeing the interplay among all of them um, is just my favorite moment of the book. Virginia Woolf's writing um, can be very dense, I think especially for someone who hasn't read her before. This was my first Virginia Woolf book I read and I didn't actually like it when I first read it uh, because I thought it was just like so complicated. Um, um, I always say that it felt like a 1,000 piece puzzle that I didn't know like the final picture to. But then when I picked it up the second time and I knew kind of just the general beats, I was able to really dive into the language itself and these characters and it is my favorite thing I've ever read. For my favorite play of all time, we have Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. My first experience with Dr. Faustus was actually seeing it live. I went on this trip to London um, with my high school drama company uh, back in my senior year and we saw this like avant-garde experimental shortened version of Dr. Faustus that um like invigorated all the weird kids and absolutely horrified all of like the Long Island moms. There were a group of like six of us who after we saw it like we're on like this trip where like some of us are 18 and can actually like drink alcohol legally for the first time and like we're in a new city and yet after this there were six of us who like went back to her, our hotel room to read the play to each other aloud in a circle um <laughs> which it really tells you like the effect that this play had on us. I don't think I properly read the full thing until college, um, and now let me tell you what it's about. This is about a man, Dr. Faustus, who strikes a deal with the devil to have 24 years um, on earth um, with um, this other, what's his name? The word I'm looking for is demon. Um, he will have Mephistopheles a demon um, as basically his personal assistant for those 24 years, and after those years, his soul is officially property of the devil. I think the way that this play plays with these notions of like power and fame and ambition are really interesting um, because you watch 
like moments of his life of those 24 years unfold um, and I don't think it goes the way that you're expecting it to or that even Faustus is expecting it to. He's kind of hoping for all these answers to the universe and that's not what he gets and his own response to his lack of under like his not getting the things that he wanted um, is to me interesting on like a psychological level. His relationship with Mephistopheles too is really interesting um, in ways that are like so loving and strained. I'm definitely do a reread of this, but I think just like coming from having read so much Shakespeare, and I love Shakespeare, many of his plays are some of my favorite plays of all time, um, this just felt so novel and was doing something like really interesting in a way that I thought literature from that time couldn't be done. My favorite poetry book of all time, which also might just be in my top five favorite books of all time, is A Coney Island of the Mind by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Poetry is one of those interesting things that you can read in so many different ways. That is obviously general. You can like find a random poem and read it online. You can read a collected works of someone um, and then you have like the curated poetry book. Um, and this was one of the first of those I really read. Um, and A, just the quality of the poetry is incredible, but B, I think this is collected and curated and sequenced in like such brilliant ways. These poems are written in the 19th 1950s and they are not about actual Coney Island but it is more a representation of like a state of mind or state of soul. I think he says yeah it's an allegory of modern life. These reflect a kind of atmosphere about life and also I do think specifically about city life. Um, I'm from New York and I do feel like a lot of these have a kind of vibrancy of the city along with them but not just like the, a city itself but the people in a city. In here contains probably my favorite poem of all time if not my favorite one of them, um, this poem called Junk Man's Obligato, um, which is just like this very long, sprawling poem um, about the the desire to get out of one's like city life. Just like the first line is, what is it? Let's go, come on, let's go, let's empty out our pockets and disappear, missing all our appointments and turning up unshaven years later and it goes on and goes on. What I love about this as a whole is I feel like it reflects both the advantages and disadvantages of modern life all in one. I think it finds a lot of beauty in modernity and yet I feel like it as it like reflected in that poem also reveals all of the bad things and like especially deals with this desire to get out. I think Ferlinghetti's style is simultaneously complex and also not incredibly demanding. Um, I think it is accessible and rich um, and I love the way he plays with enjambment and with like th the visual structure of his poems. He's someone I really want to check out more of and I think this collection is a great place to start with him um, and also just a really accessible poetry book for people who love poetry and people who are trying to get into it alike. Next we have nonfiction. And let me just start by saying I've read probably fewer than 10 nonfiction books for pleasure in my entire life. Like I've probably read things for classes and for school like all across the board um, but so few of them have stuck with me. But my favorite of all time is The Poisoner's Handbook by Deborah Bloom. Something that most of you probably don't know about me is that I was very very big into chemistry in high school to the extent that I applied to colleges as a chemistry major. I also was really obsessed with Dexter. Um, I thought I wanted to be a forensic scientist for the longest time. Time. And so when I found this book, um, it drew me right in because this is about the invention of forensic toxicology in 1920s New York. Science was not a huge part of crime fighting or crime solving, I guess we'll call it, um, in the early 20th century. Um, but Charles Norris and Alexander Gettler, who were what, a medical examiner and toxicologist, um, realized that all these people were dying of poisons in various instances, whether it be murder or just like slow poisoning over time. Um, and this book chronicles um, their, not adventures, their journey to like get forensic toxicology to be a thing. Each chapter is a different like compound or element, so you have chloroform, wood alcohol, cyanides, arsenic, mercury, so on and so forth, and it goes through just like the cases that led to these two men's discoveries of how these poisons work on the body and also how they can be discovered and used in crime solving scenarios. What I especially like about this book is I think it is a nice blend of history of the time, um, science, it's not too sciencey though, like someone who's not super into science would still get something out of it, and also like the personal journeys of these two men, especially Alexander Gettler. A lot of people really did not respect the work that he was doing um, because it was so novel, and so you, you follow him through like his determination um, to prove his scientific endeavors. Like I think he writes like this like 
hundred page paper on cyanide that is still referenced today. I could get, be getting some of those details wrong, but this is a simultaneous portrait of history and ambition and science that I think all comes together to be a super interesting read. Next I want to talk about my favorite YA book. Um, I, like many teens, read a lot of YA in middle school and high school, especially the ones that were mental health focused, um, because your girl was not healthy for many years of her life. Um, and I really, like, I read a lot of classics in high school too. I, that's really when I got into reading all the classics, but I was kind of like simultaneously reading my Albert Camus and like all of my John Green books. I don't really pick up YA these days just because I don't find myself really getting a lot out of them, um, but I have full respect for the genre, and I think my favorite YA book that I've actually read, reread recently, and I think it holds up, and that is Last Night I Sank to the Monster by Benjamin Alir Sainz. This book in particular is about an 18-year-old named Zach who is at an alcohol rehab facility um, with a bunch of adults, since he's technically an adult, but he does not really recall how he got there. So this book is about his process of recovery, both from alcohol addiction and also his memory recovery, and you just follow him through his time at this facility. I think what I especially liked about this book and continue to like is that it treats Zach as a person. I think a lot of YA books, um, especially mental healthy ones, um, treat its subjects as teens either for drama of the book or just like don't give them any kind of respect. Like these are teen problems that will go away. And I think in placing him as a teen but in an adult center, his problems both in the universe of the book and also in our universe in this being a book treat his problems as real. I think this book is aware of the responsibility that YA books have. It knows its audience. Um, it doesn't feel at any point just like inspiration porn, and yet at the same time I think it tells this very realistic story of this boy and his attempt to, to make a better life for himself. I think the writing is beautiful. I think it's true that if YA isn't something you read a lot, um, it might not really connect with you, but if that is still a genre that you find yourself picking up, I cannot recommend this enough. The next category is interesting. Um, I have all these like clear genres coming up, horror and sci-fi or whatever, and I was like, oh, I should have an adult contem contemporary book. I've totally read a lot of those, right? And I realized I have not read a lot of books from like the 21st century that are actually contemporary. I feel like that is the most popular genre among people and yet I've read almost nothing. And that is not to devalue the book I'm about to talk about because I do genuinely love it, but it was just a much smaller field than I expected it to be. But my favorite, um, I guess, adult contemporary book is Nevada by Imogen Binney. I shouldn't be using adult contemporary. I think that is like a, a music genre to describe like Kelly Clarkson, but just contemporary. This is a contemporary book. There is nothing fantastical or sci-fi about it. It's just a book about people that was written recently. Nevada is about a trans woman named Maria who is kind of struggling to stick to her more punk roots while just living a normal life and a retail job and like having to be an adult. Her relationship with her girlfriend is kind of falling apart um, and that sets her off on this journey and you just follow Maria's life for at least the first half of the book. I refuse to tell you what the second half of this book is about because when I got there on my own reading um, the second half of the book just like so blew me away because there was oh my nail just fell off. Anyways, there's no indication on like the back of this book or anything that there even is a second part, so I'm kind of spoiling it by even saying that at all. But I cannot speak to this personally, but from everything I've seen in Goodreads reviews and just other people reviewing this online, this seems to get the trans experience, or at least parts of it, very right. It is representation that has meant a lot to a lot of people. Maria is a very complex character. She is not always likable. She does not always make decisions that you want her to make. And I think despite that, the book has like the utmost respect and love for her. And I feel like holds her accountable for these decisions um, without ever shitting on her. At the end of the day, I think she is one of the most complex and rootable main characters I've ever read. And this like central idea of like wanting to stick to like more rebellious roots when you are forced to like just be an adult who works a nine to five and pays taxes. I think that is a struggle that pretty much anyone can relate to unless you grew up really excited to work a nine to five and pay taxes. Um, and I think as far as trans rep and literature goes, this is pretty easily the best I've ever read. Next for my favorite fantasy of all time, we have The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern, which is also one of my top five favorite books of all time. In this book, there is a circus that arrives overnight without warning. Um, it is magical 
and beautiful and aesthetically lush and gorgeous and the question of fake magic versus real magic is a question that circus goers must ask themselves. The central plot of this is that there are two teens, Celia and Marco, who um, unbeknownst to themselves are in this competition set up by two people who trained them. The competition of the two people is that um, they both, they challenge each other to raise the better magician um, and at the end there will be one victor. And at the end of the competition only one of them can be left alive. And you just follow them as they slowly decide discover that they are a part of this whole mess. Um, and it jumps back and forth in time because you also see the lives of the two people that trained them. Um, and just while all of this is happening, you just have the most like lush, beautiful writing and atmospheres that are grand and that are beautiful and that are grandiose and ooh. This might be like the single most elegant book I've ever read. Like if I could get transported into the universe of any book, it might be this. This is not a book with a highly established magic system or fantasy world. Um, it's magic, I think, is in moments and there is real magic. Like it is definitively a fantasy book. I don't think there's ever any real question from the reader as to whether magic is happening. Um, but I do, I think there is magic in its bookish elements too. This is just my way of saying the prose is like astoundingly gorgeous. Um, that's what drew me to this in the first place and uh, what continues to be my impression of it. Many people don't like this book because it feels at points like nothing happens or what was the point or like the writing's too confusing, but I'm calling bullshit on all of that because I think this is stunning. I do think the central plot um, is amazing, kind of developed into a bit of a romance, which I guess is a bit of a spoiler, but I don't really think it is because like the second they meet, you can tell something's gonna happen between them and I think it's done incredibly well. And I just think this is a beautiful, beautiful book. And for people who look for aesthetics in their books, um, they will really love this. Staying in the uh, my top five favorite books of all time realm, for my favorite horror book of all time, we have House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. I'm gonna do the best description of House of Leaves that I can possibly do. In the universe of this book, there is a manuscript. This manuscript is written by a guy named Zampano, and this manuscript is basically a long, um, analysis and review of this movie. Uh, the movie is a documentary about a family that moves into a house that they slowly discover is like bigger on the inside. There are corridors that like expand infinitely. And this man named Johnny has gotten a hold of this manuscript that Zampano has written. And this book is a mixture of the manuscript, footnotes within the manuscript, Johnny commenting on the manuscript and also telling us about his life, his life, and also an appendix that has just like other details. There's a lot going on, it's very postmodern, but I think the big central question that makes this a horror book, if you will, is Johnny trying to figure out whether the, like, the film that Zampano is reviewing was real at all and questions of reality and fiction happen throughout every single page of this thing. There's also obviously horror within the documentary itself because the family going through this is going through something absolutely horrifying and Zampano kind of has moments in his manuscript where he just like recounts scenes so you're really immersed like in the family's life. This is one of the most brilliant pieces of art I've ever gotten to consume. I think it's complexity, um, it never feels gimmicky. There are pages where there are only like a few words on a page and it doesn't just feel dumb. It feels intentional to produce this uncanny effect. And similarly, I think there is this impression that House of Leaves is just like the weird book. The weird book that's really big, really long and does a lot of stuff. But at its heart, I think it has a lot of heart. Johnny's life, even though he's kind of a vile person, is so interesting to read about and I think you end up caring for him even at points where you don't want to care about him. And similarly, well maybe not even similarly, but along with that, um, I think the stuff that happens to the family might be like the most heartfelt stuff of all time. The husband is really the one who is the like go-getter in like exploring the house but that obviously puts a strain on his relationship with his wife who is just scared for his life and also the man's brother is a part of this and trying to figure it all out and like those family dynamics are something that is not lost in this behemoth of a book. This is perhaps the most immersive reading experience I have ever had. It really takes you into its 
completely labyrinthine universe um, and you get completely lost in it just like they get lost in the house you see um, and I think it is both terrifying and also incredibly heartfelt um, and I recommend it to fans of horror and I'm gonna say romance and contemporary fiction and classics alike it's so good another genre I really have not read a lot of but is also tricky to categorize is historical fiction because at what point does something become historical fiction but something that is like definitively always characterized as such and is one of my favorite books of all time is Burial Rites by Hannah Kent. This book is about the last ever execution in Iceland. Um, there is a woman named Agnes who is accused of murder and before she is going to be executed she is sent to live with a rural family for some amount of time um, who is obviously not very pleased to be housing a like convicted murderess. This book follows Agnes um, as she is living her final days um, with this family and also as she is kind of telling her story to the family and also um, her relationship with a priest who she has chosen to be like her spiritual guide as she is about to get executed. It bounces back and forth between um, point of view and present and tense kind of without warning um, which I really love but can understand if that's confusing to certain readers who aren't expecting that. And there's kind of this question throughout the book um, of whether Agnes is really guilty of the thing she is about to be murdered for and that's not a question that's answered for the reader right away. You kind of get to learn Agnes's life as the family gets to learn Agnes's life. And atmospherically and aesthetically I think this is just like so wonderful. Um, it gives off this very very, like, it's very much the cover of this book. You're in cold, cold Iceland, um, in this bleak, bleak environment, and this woman who obviously has, like, a bleak outlook because she's about to die, and yet I feel like there is this weird amount of hope in this book. It's dealing with themes of goodness and morality and guilt and womanhood, um, and I think it wraps all those things together really nicely while having this interesting non-conventional storytelling method. And I think Hannah Kent's prose is just so beautiful. That's, I feel like, a common thread amongst books that, like, I really, really love is the quality of the prose matters maybe more to me than, like, plot. So I think if you're a fan of historical fiction and Iceland and the 1800s and strong women, this would appeal to you. But also, if you're just a fan of really good writing and interesting storytelling, I really recommend this. And finally, we have my favorite sci-fi, which I feel like it, it's both a legitimate answer, but also really truly reveals, like, I don't read a lot of genre fiction, um, and that is Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. Don't get me wrong, like, this is a science fiction book, um, but it's not like... It doesn't, I don't know, it, for some reason to me this feels like kind of like a contemporary slash sci-fi hybrid, which is what I liked about it, and we'll get into that. But like, if you've got any sci-fi recs for me, please let me know, because I would like to read more books of other genres. I think I've accidentally spoiled too much of this book in a previous video I talked about this book, so we're gonna go more minimal with it. But this is about um, three people, Kathy, Ruth, and Tommy, um, and you kind of watch their young adult to adult years in this special isolated school. You kind of figure out along with them uh, that they are special and they don't really know what makes them special um, until like, yeah, like midway through the book. <laughs> and the book is narrated by Kathy years down the road as she's kind of looking back on her life in that school um, and her life with Ruth and Tommy and what's going on with her life now as she reconnects with them. I'm not gonna tell you what makes this book sci-fi, you're really just gonna have to take my word for it. I personally was spoiled about like the twist in this book going in, which is why I thought like, oh, it's fine, whatever. But I can imagine that there is like this intense moment of figuring out things alongside them. I do think the reason I'm doubting myself about this pick is because like at its core it's about this like very human, it's, it's very much about the human relationships, it's not like about a sci-fi we need to go stop the robot from killing the planet or something, like it's about the the human side of all of this. Um, but, but it's still it's still a sci-fi book. There's a sci-fi twist um, And that is a very important part of the book. So those are my 10 favorite books by genre There are some key genres that I really just have nothing for um, In terms of romance or thriller which are oddly like two of the biggest genres on booktube um, Most of my favorite booktubers really love 
thriller and or romance so it's weird that I feel like I haven't read like a single book from either of those categories. I mean a lot of the books that I've read and loved have romance in them but I don't know if I've read one that would be just considered a romance. I think one of the things is that I like reading books that I know or at least I think I'm gonna like. I generally stick to genres that I enjoy because I know I enjoy them and I at the end of the day if I'm gonna invest time into a book I want to read something that I like. But hey I don't know what I like if I haven't read it so maybe I'll challenge myself to go out and read more fantasy, sci-fi, thrillers, and romance so I can have uh, really fully formed opinions on these genres and things. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you have found some new books to go pick up um, and leave me some recommendations if you have any based on any of the books I've talked about and uh, you will see me in the next one.